one. It's a place to get Pete coming in from Melbourne, Australia. Let me tell you, coming in from Los Angeles, one of the biggest rock and roll stars in the world, and it's 2022. This man has done it all. Headliner for the Beatles, gone on tour with Sam Cooke. He knows everybody. He was there. He loves Richie Valens like I do. How are you today, Chris Montez? Hey, glad to be on your show. It's so nice to be here with you. Now, Chris, I've got to ask you, are you feeling groovy? I'm feeling groovy. <laughs> hey, bananas, we think you're groovy. Hey, bananas, we want you groovy. We want you groovy. Drive your tune buggies everywhere. Just going crazy without a care. Hey, bananas, we think you're groovy. Hey, bananas, we think you're groovy. Now, Chris, I gotta say, now that we're feeling groovy, <laughs> let's talk about all the groovy things that happened in your life right now. Okay. Anybody watching this show? That's big fans of the Beatles, big fans of the Beach Boys, big fans yep. of George Harrison. You're going to love this interview because you don't get bigger than Chris Montez. Oh, and let me tell you, everyone loves your song. That song that you did right, Let's Dance, 1962, yeah. is bigger now than ever. You know that, don't you? No, I didn't know that, but it's good that people love it still. No, it's the greatest song. And let me tell you. You're embedded in pop culture, and I'll tell you why. We're going to start, and I'll ask you some questions, and let's get into it. Okay. In 1963, Chris Montez and uh, Tommy Rowe, they go to the yep. UK. They do a tour, and Chris Montez is the headliner, <laughs> and down below is a band called The Beatles, right? Yeah. And you are the star, and they are part of the program. How great was that? <laughs> I don't know what happened to those guys. I, I don't know if they ever made it or not. <laughs> now, I want to ask you, Chris, it's very important because you knew the Beatles before the Beatles became big. So it's That's March 1963. And when you found out the name, these guys are on the show called yes. the Beatles. What yeah. did you think of the name Beatles? What did it mean to you? Did you say, what's its name? What is it? I didn't understand. I thought it was a bug name or something. But, but when I talked to Paul and they said it meant a beat, you know, the Beatles, the beats, you know. So that's that's what I, they introduced themselves to me. What was it like doing the shows and hanging out with them, right? And they're, was, they're on the crest of becoming bigger the next month, but you're there before anyone in America really knows about the Beatles. They're wearing Beatles suits. They're wearing Beatles shoes. And you're, these girls are screaming. All this mania is starting to happen, and you're there, the headliner. <laughs> And they're down there. This is fantastic. Tell it me was, about the tour. It was wonderful. I mean, I first encounter of the I'd never been out of the country, and then I meet these four guys, and there was an aura about them, and 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 the different groups that came around. They were like trying to impress. Maybe it was the, the groove at the time, you know, that the British were going through. But uh, they were funny guys, and we hung out and we practiced together on stage a few times. Paul and George played my guitar because they didn't have Fender Stratocasters then. And then I got introduced to, they took me to their tailor and I got some suits and boots made, you know, and they took me around town. We had a few drinks. We had lots of laughs. And they introduced me to the first word I ever heard about. Uh, uh, there's a couple uh, uh, birds hanging out waiting for us. I'm saying, what are birds? You know, <laughs> And I didn't know it was girls, you know. And it was it was chaotic. We couldn't go anywhere. It was crazy. They'd attack us. Uh, I remember being in a hotel, and it was like four stories up. And um, I say, "Come on, Paul or John, you go up there first. And he go by the window and he lean out the, toward the hotel, and they'd be screaming downstairs. And they say, "Okay, your turn, Paul. No, no, you." And so I we alternate. And it was funny. It was, it was a big joke. You know, I got to say, you're one of the greatest people in rock and roll history and you're one of the nicest guys. Thank you. And it's like amazing because here you are and you get caught up in the mania and you get to hear the album. Please, please me before anybody in the world gets to hear the album. You That's get to thing. hear it. How big is that? That was wonderful because I said, hey, they left for a few days. I said, hey, you guys, where did you go? And they said, we we're finishing our 
uh, album, Paul tells me. He goes, and so we had a room upstairs, and we went up and had a few beers, and he says, you want to hear it? And I said, yeah, play it. And Paul plays this album, and the first song that caught me was, well, she was just 17, you know, and I said, oh, Paul, I love that song. And I, he, I had to play it five, six times. He said, you really like that song? I said, yeah. I've been with John and Paul. I'm just saying they had different characters. We know that, right? I mean, yeah, John but- is moody, and John can get upset, and John can do this, but the great thing is you're on tour, and then they had a party, and then you're in a bus sleeping, and John pours beer on your head. I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> oh, I guess this is just his character. It got me mad, and I, we got into a squabble, and they parted us. We ended up on the floor in a tangle, and they parted us, you know, separated us. But it was it was just one of those things. I, I wouldn't change the, the experience for nothing, you know. And and I think about all the wonderful things I, I learned from them and watching them. Because when I first saw them go on the first night, I said, wow, these guys could rock. But I never, because I've been on the road a lot with Sam Cook and he's in, working on my chop, and I never realized that they were playing the hardcore bars. You know, that's where you learn when people start making fun or telling, do this or do that. So they were professional. And when they went on, I said, wow, these guys can rock. And every night I used to hear them sing, love, love, me too. <laughs> Every night. <laughs> they gave you a promo picture of their pictures, then they wrote to Chris Montez, and they all signed it. Have you still got that? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I had a, I had uh, the book, yeah. Yeah. And um, I sold it because they want, somebody wanted to buy it. I just sold it. But I got the original. I got copies of that photo. I'll send it to you with them all signing it. And everybody says, God bless the Queen and this and that. And John Lennon says, Chris, remember Manchester or Mansfield? That's where we got in an argument. <laughs> I think it was funny. But isn't it great when you look back on these fantastic photos of yourself with the Beatles and Tommy Rowe? I mean, that's history there. You know, oh. that that is Beatle history right there before the Beatles made it. And you're the headliner. And they're yeah. all looking at you. Like, they got photos. I've seen <laughs> photos with Fats Domino. I've seen photos with... Uh, different people but you're the man I mean, this is fantastic <laughs> uh, it was a blessing god blessed me with all these tours and all this activity that i had in my life and and uh and uh i remember going to uh um well you know when we finished the tour uh we became friends and you know what i i, I gotta tell you this is the first time i ever told anybody but i i was so perturbed and hassled because of the argument that i would sit by myself in the front of the bus and, and Paul would always come and sit with me next to me. He said, come on, Chris, let's be, I said, get away from me, Paul. I don't want to talk with you. I don't want nothing to do with you guys. And he did that several times. And I think of, I reflect on that and say, you know, he's such a humble, beautiful person, Paul McCartney is. And, and uh, we hit it off. And, and when I came to Los Angeles, when they were, when they came to America, I was surfing at the time, and I hear my little radio, and now the Beatles have landed. And I said, big deal. I just got through doing a month with them. You know? And and then they invited me to the ballet house where they were staying. It was all surrounded by, you know, police and reporters. And I walk in, and the first thing, oh, uh, uh, before I lead to that, I used to sometimes sing, take off my shirt and sing to the girls. And then there was a song on the album, on Let's Dance, it was called, you're the one, you're the one I'll live and die for. It was a ballad, you know. And and when I came in uh, to the Hollywood house, I opened the door and walked in, and Paul sees me, and he gets on his knees and starts saying, you're the one. <laughs> I said, oh, come on, Paul. It was kind of embarrassing, but I, I reflect on it and say, what a wonderful thing that was. You're the one. You're the one. When they came to America and they were that big and you yeah. went and saw them, tell yeah. me more about that. It must have been exciting now because it's a different time. I went to see them in their house. So I hung out with them and drank a few beers and talked and that was it. I never saw them in concert in America because I've been, you know, I've been all, and they were so busy, you know, and, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. I must say that when we're closing the show, the last show I, we did in Liverpool, uh, Paul and John were talking to their tailor and they said, 
uh, I said, how's it going? I'm going to see, say, I said, guys, I'll see you guys. It was wonderful hanging out with you guys. And he said, Chris, I hope you don't mind, but we're getting our suits made like a suit. And that, well, that round collar came from the suit I used to wear on stage all the time. So when I see this album, Meet the Beatles, I see that jacket that I have. <laughs> That's great that you were influenced on them. Can I ask you, was their tailor Doug Millings? Was that his name, Doug Millings? Yes. Yeah, that's who it was. Yeah, and he made some beautiful suits. And then I had, uh, and then they took me to the bootery and I had like six pairs of sh boots made. What can I say? History, I've been blessed. <laughs> Have you still got a few of those suits? I got both of them. <laughs> here they are. I'll... Move back a little bit here. Let's see. How great's that? That's that from 1963? Yeah. Let me see. Let me and did they still it. fit you? Yeah. And here's the other one, the wrong collar. See that? Which one's your favorite? Uh, this is the one I used to wear all the time, the wrong collar. Let me slip one on. Yeah, please. <laughs> I'll put this one here. Yeah, I like that one. Oh, I like that one a lot. Yeah. I think it fits. And that's made in 1963, yeah? Yeah. Unbelievable. Oh. Look at that. Just stand back up here. You look a million dollars. Stay, <laughs> keep the jacket on. You look too good. <laughs> that's it. See? The original. Fantastic. A beautiful, beautiful suits. And you got exactly. Beetle Boots too, yeah? Yeah, I, I, they got lost somewhere. You know, but I don't have those because I kept my jackets and I still have the original guitar that they played, you know, my Stratocaster Fender. And if I run across Paul one of these days, hopefully I'm going to see if he'll sign my guitar. Because it's like yeah. the, last, the next encounter in our lives, you know, before, you know, you never know. <laughs> I'm sure he will, Chris. Now, let me tell you, you know what's amazing? You're part of this Beatle history at the greatest part. To me, the number one album is Please Please Me, because yes. without that album, there'd be no other album. It was that great. I love it. Yeah, it was wonderful. I think that was a second hit in England, I think, Please Please Me. Yes. And, uh, well, you know, I just, it was wonderful hanging out with them, partying with them. Uh, they took me and taught me some of their culture. And, and, and you know, I've never seen cobblestone streets. Or, and then it's funny that I had to, uh, when the rooms, they gave me uh, 10 pence and pence and I had to put them in, in the, to get the heater work. I dropped 10 pence so that <laughs> it's just so the heater would work. Isn't that something? Not only were you with the Beatles, but you grew up in Hawthorne. Yes. And you used to play rock and roll songs with the Beach Boys. This is amazing now. Tell me about the Beach Boys and you actually went to uh, high school with them and you went to some classes, what, with Al Jardine, right. yeah? Yeah, Al Jardine and Brian Wilson and the Wilson Brothers. I used to go to their house when we were in high school and go practice and play rock and roll songs like Johnny Be Good and, and whatever. And um, and Brian would be on piano and Dennis and Carl would be on drums. And it was, it was we're just kids have hanging out, you know, and never realizing, you know, where our, our lives were going. And then one day Brian and I were standing in front of his house. He says, yeah, we're going to sign a contract with a, uh, a company. And I said, so am I. And he says, he says, we're going to call ourselves the Beach Boys. <laughs> I tell people this. I said to myself, the Beach Boys. I mean, I surf more than they do, you know. <laughs> and that was phenomenal to me. And uh, it was a wonderful name. You know, never know, right? You know, it's unbelievable. You grew up with the Beach Boys, and then you went into the Beatles before anyone knew the Beatles. I mean, that's like a life journey. Just there, when you came back. Did you yeah. tell the Did you tell the Beach Boys about the Beatles? I know. Did you have? They already were all popping all over the place, you know. And the thing is, is it's funny. Um, I used to it, I, in high school. I had Brian highly. I mean, uh, Brian Wilson in my uh, class. And one time, the, the professor was teaching us. Is was it? Uh, I think it was science. And he he sometimes he was calling about had no hair and he was tall and he say. And it was sometimes when it get warm in the class, he'd say, he'd blow his nose and then wipe his head, you know, with his, and we, and we would all say, wow, you know, he just blew his nose and wiped his forehead. <laughs> Cause, and then one day he says, I got to leave class. Brian, get up here and um, uh, 
run the class. So, so Brian gets up there and he does a say what he our teachers say. Okay, settle down, guys, settle down. And then he he automatically pretend he blew his nose and he warped his forehead and we started laughing because he imitated him exactly. <laughs> it was funny, but uh, we got to hang out Brian and I a lot. And then uh, I, one incident where, uh, I don't know, there's, when I was in high school, this, this little girl that used to, she was, a, I guess, junior high, and I was just a freshman in high school or sophomore. And uh, she'd come in, in to my friend's house with his, his sister, and she'd say, hi, Zeke. My, everybody knows me as Zeke because my real name is Ezekiel Christopher Montañez. So that was my nickname, Cut, Zeke. And so she said, hi, Zeke, and she'd flirt with me, and then she'd go away and then come back, you know. And it ended up being Olivia, you know, Arias, Olivia Arias married, you know who. Yeah, Olivia Harrison. She ended up marrying George Harrison when yeah, she went for the yeah. record company. Yeah, isn't that phenomenal? That's amazing to me. You know what's amazing? That you go through this circle of life and everything's connected to you. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's, it is, you know, because – uh it's it's phenomenal you know it's it's been a wonderful thing um for me and and the different people i've encountered i look at all the artists that i've been honored to play with uh as picture frames of history in my life that i that i came a long way around to hear them and see them in person and, and be on the same show with them that's amazing to me <laughs> what was it like with smokey robinson i love the guy Oh, the, it, we, it was, we were doing all the black theaters and Smokey would always be out there and he'd sing his songs, you know, and I'd watch him. And then one time he says, Chris, let's go. And he and his wife took me to lunch. And when we were walking down one part of the city, they'd say, there's Smokey, there's Smokey. You know, you hear all these whispers, there's Smokey, you know, so they knew him. He was a great person. He still is. I mean, you know. You know, the Beatles covered one of his songs and made him money. You yeah. heard that. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's great. The Beatles love Smokey too. Now, oh, yeah. As I said, when you look back on your career, it's just totally amazing. And the great thing is when you did the song Let's Dance, that was the same producers that did Johnny Burnett. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the people I was hooked up with. Yes. Right. And when I first met him, and then I was sitting at the piano writing my first song, which was a ballad called All You Had to Do Was Tell Me. And it was a regional hit. And then uh, and then, uh, uh, and then, one day we're playing the piano, and, and, and Johnny comes to the door, and he, say, he says, come on in. And he says, Chris, he says, Johnny, this is Chris. And, and I said, he says, Johnny Burnett. I said, you're Johnny Burnett? He said, yeah. He's, and he had that, you look like a dream, you know, that it was number one in the States already, you know. And I was, wow. It's the same when I met Richie Valens. I, I was uh, at his little hop and standing way in the back and it was like 300 people. And he said, Richie will be out in a minute, you know? So I said, my thought was, I'll just hear him sing La Bamba and, and Donna and say I was there at the place where it happened, right? And to make a long story short, so I'm standing there and all of a sudden I turned to my right and Richie Valens is standing next to me. And that's amazing because it was, to me it was God sent. I said, I looked over and I said, you're Richie Valens, aren't you? And he smiled. He said, yeah. I said, wow, I couldn't, I got stumbled for words. I just, you know, I was in awe. And then I said, and I said, I want to be a singer like it, like you. And he said, yeah. And then later on, five months later on, or six months later, he got killed. But my, my foundation was that I said, if I ever become a popular artist, I'm going to treat people like Richie Valens treated me kindly. And that's it. <laughs> you know, La Bamba and uh, Donna, to me, they're two of the greatest songs out there. They just like, they just hit the spot. Just so unique and so fantastic. Yeah. I, I, every time I perform, and people cry and, and, you know, and sing along with me. <laughs> now, listen, when you were with the Beatles, I've got to say, those days are gone now when they were chasing you and ripping at your clothes and wanting your autograph there in England. Yeah. Yes. Did you ever think that you should have stayed in England for a bit longer? Because well, of the Beatles thing, I'm just saying. I thought about moving there for a while, but not because of of the fame, but I uh, because of I love the country and the people are so they never forget you. Once you're here and they love you, that's it. They know more about you than you know about yourself. All the stuff you've done, you know, and that's that's phenomenal. 
And I remember that I was warned from somebody said, watch yourself because the girls up there, sometimes they, they jump on stage and attack you. I didn't think nothing of it. And he says, if that ever happens, the first person that comes to you, grab her, put your arms around her and hold on to her. And sure enough, it happened and they knocked me down. And the girl that was that I was holding to, she got all beat up. <laughs> now listen, you gotta tell me what it was like being on American Bandstand. I mean, that must have like blew your mind. How oh, great yeah. was that with Dick Clark? Tell me about that. Uh, you know, I come home one day and, and then after having the release and they said, with Let's Say, and they said, they want you to be on Dick Clark. Cause I used to come home from high school and from school and watch the show all the time. You know, these rock artists. And I said, you're kidding. So next thing, first time out of the city on the plane, first time on the plane. And I go there and, and there's Dick Clark, like he is, you know, and it was, it was so great to meet him. And I got to talk for him for a while. And then he says, and now we like to introduce Chris Montez. And, and it was, it was, I could I couldn't believe it was happening. When you look back, I'm just saying from all the people that you met, the greatest yeah. artists and everybody, yes. and even today, the Beatles have got the biggest influence. And so has Richie Valens. Yeah. But what I'm I, saying is within yourself, how do you feel now when you look back on your fantastic career and think I was there when it was happening? That's, that's the key, you know, that yeah. time period of 62, yeah. 63 to me is the greatest time. I think when I reflect on that, I think how, how privileged I was to go through all that rock era, you know, because I was going through the South where the first time I ever saw black and white only, and I'm traveling with these famous black artists, you know, and and, and then uh, and then going from that to the Beatles. And, and to me, uh, personally, there's no greater group than the Beatles in the songwriting, their performance, and their character, you know. And I'm, I'm honored that I got to hang with them, and, and uh, they were... Uh, my opening act. <laughs> <laughs> hey, baby, won't you take a chance? Say that you let me have this dance, a last dance, a last dance. We'll do the twist, the stump, the mouth, the tail, too. Any of the dances that you want to do, a last dance, a last dance. <laughs> what was the second single after let's dance uh i had uh well the dancing all over and yeah, the dancing everywhere i go you know you see it on the tv and i hear it on the radio gonna twist gonna stop with you do the wobble and i want to see too <laughs> no commotion here we come Gonna have some kind of fun. Some kind of fun. That was popular after Life Sands in England. Have you written a book at all, can I ask? No, I'm I'm trying to finish it. And and it's you know, I started with writing a serious book, but you know, people want just short stories, so I'm gonna write little pieces like I tell you, you know, when I tell you this happened to me or or Paul McCartney sang to me. I'm that's what I'm gonna put in my book, just small incidents that that and things that happened to me as I was growing up. And I think that's that's what people want to read instead of details and details of nonsense, you know. Yeah. Do you know the odd do you know the name of the book is yet? No, no, no. I have no idea. And you're playing live too now. You're doing some really great concerts out there for the people. Have you got anything coming up? Well I got a few uh shows going to New York and back and then I'm doing a a couple of uh, boat cruises. You can find it on my Facebook and and uh, that's where I'm at, you know. And um, of course, you know, I grew going through my life at the at a younger age. I got married, I had children, and I and then I decided to study music. And I studied at conservatory of music for composition, and I studied jazz because I love jazz. And, and it's just and my first teacher was a good classical teacher, so I learned a lot about Via Lobos and all these classical movements. But it's not for performance; it's just for you know your mind stimulation. And I and and I feel gifted that I can look at music and see it and read it. You know, you look younger than ever. I'm not joking. <laughs> it's 2022, and I see your videos of Let's Dance, yeah. and I'm telling you, you you look fantastic. Really, they must love you on stage. 
Uh, yeah, they say that's they say that's not Chris Montez. I said that's me. <laughs> but I I do a lot of I try to keep myself in shape. I do a lot of running. At one time, I was doing a lot of boxing. You know, as I was growing up, I I I even studied for a long time with Chuck Norris. You know, the karate guy. So I've been exposed to all kinds of things. Not to be tough or anything. So I'm not tough. I don't want to be tough. But it was just for my physical and my mental attitude. Just tell my, them your links if you can, Chris. Oh, it's go to Facebook, Chris Montez at Facebook.com. I want to thank you so much for being on on the Plasky P live TV show with me, Chris. You are a rock and roll legend that will live on forever. Your star will never fade. And I'm gonna say, Plastic EP salutes you. And let's dance is one of the greatest songs. <laughs> yeah. And it's just unbelievable, even today in 2022. It's been a pleasure doing your show, and I'm honored to be on your show, and I'm honored that you invited me, and, and I'm looking forward to meeting all my fans just to say hello.